Coaching Soccer Weekly, episode 372, Developing Soccer IQ, Enhancing Decision-Making on the Field, Entertaining, Educational, and Inspiring Soccer Content to Help Make You a More Effective Coach, Player, or Soccer Parent. Hello, and welcome back to Coaching Soccer Weekly, presented by World Class Coaching. My name is Sega Verbinovich, and this is the podcast devoted to bringing you cutting-edge methods, techniques, and tactics for coaching soccer. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced coach who has been training teams for many years, or if you're new to coaching and working with the team for the very first time. There's something we can all do to take our coaching to the next level. Well, welcome back to the show. It was... An interesting weekend. It was the long weekend here in Canada, and I didn't have games Saturday, Sunday. I did have something on Monday. I did do, uh, I went to a girls' tournament. Again, I'll talk about that's something that I'm kind of working on, uh, and, and that'll be something that's going to be clear uh, probably in the end of August, start of September. I'll start talking about it. But regardless, it was a futsal tournament and a gym. Um, it was 2012s, 2011s. Uh, girls and it went from about 10 30 11 uh in the morning to eight at night so really long day uh and i just got to watch a lot of different girls playing different teams and stuff like that so it was really interesting to watch and you know unfortunately what i saw was the same thing with every team it was essentially who was the better team at passing uh didn't see any 1v1 moves, any deceptive dribbling. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, you know, taking players on. Uh, it was just, you know, if you made a mistake and didn't receive the ball the right way, uh, or you made a bad pass, then that usually ended up in a goal. So uh, I was, uh, it was a little disappointing to see that, you know, the girls game uh, w- with the girls that were there, uh, they just weren't, you know, at that stage where, they were encouraged to be creative, be brave on the ball, and and really try to stand out. It was really difficult to find a player that stood out that whole day, and uh, I think that's not good. You know, uh, if these girls want to take that next level into university and college, and every single other player in that showcase is able to pass and receive, which they should be able to at that level. You know, what sets you apart from that 6,000 players that are trying out for, you know, that division one school. And it's gotta be you doing something special. And I just didn't really see that. So uh, still a really good experience. It was nice to see teams that weren't my teams and, just watch a youth game and not really have a interest in, you know, a specific team or specific players. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a really interesting, long, interesting Monday, but, uh, other than that really great weekend, uh, time off. And now the season starts this weekend, we have all our teams playing all our, so we have our two tier one teams playing our U nines and our U tens. And then our U11s and U12s are playing as well. Those teams are the U11s and 12s are playing in Tier 2. We only have one team in each of those age groups. We have a Tier 1 and a Tier 2 in 2013, which is that U10, and a Tier 1 and Tier 2 in that U9, which is our 2014-2015 team. So excited for that. Um, I'll be able to be at, I think, three games this weekend. I'm really going to try and get to as many games as I can. Uh, We have two home games and... Yeah, the U9s are still in festival format, so they'll get two games uh, about every other weekend is how it works out. Um, But yeah, I'll keep you posted, as I always do. Uh, This Monday, I also didn't have my VO meeting uh, because we didn't have games, and uh, you know it was a good break, I think, for parents and players. So, um, you know, excited to get back into it. And I think I'm going to start filming my practices using VO. Uh, There's something that I'm working on as well with that uh, for all of you coaches um, that will probably be available. I don't know, hopefully within six months is really what I'm trying to do. But 
uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and, and really start to record sessions, rondos, things like that. And then I'm excited to get back into the way that we do things with VO, you know, Monday night meetings, be able to watch league games, uh, multiple teams playing, able to pick out which teams are doing the right things that we can show in the Monday meeting. And then what things aren't so good and that we need to work on and showing that in the Monday meetings as well. If you do have a VO, which I'm pretty sure most people do right now, uh, you know, I think it's a really good idea once a week, once every couple of weeks, or even once a month. Uh, have your team meet through Zoom, uh, you know, 45 minutes, and just kind of go through things. When the players watch themselves, I think it's a really, really good way to show them the good things and the things they need to work on. Um, and if you don't have a VO, you can use our code, $200 off. Uh, but yeah, thanks VO for being a sponsor of the show. As we really get into outdoor, what I love doing as soon as we get outside is a lot more tactical stuff that we don't usually get to do in indoor. The reason we don't get to do in indoor is because our indoor locations are usually really small, usually futsal gyms and stuff like that. So when I go outside and I have this much space, we really love to start doing some tactical things and, and really get the players to understand how we play from a tactical point of view. What we've done is we've actually gone and played 7v7, 9v9 uh, games during practices, which is something that I've never really done. And the reason that we're doing that is just so some of these players, the new players, because we have a bunch of new players, they can really see what it's like and really understand the tactical uh, reasoning behind it. Now, I'm going to do my best to talk about how we do it. But essentially, the base idea is rondos, right? If you've heard me talk about rondos before, it's rondos for us are used tactically. Simply put, that is what we want out of our rondos. We want our players to understand how to move on the ball and off the ball, mostly off the ball in rondos. The idea of supporting, losing your player, and also uh, receiving with the furthest foot, communication, all those things are things that we talk about in rondos along with scanning which is something that i'm going to talk about a lot today and all those things come together to really increase the player's iq so when you have the foundation of rondos and you can go back and listen to the rondo episodes what you can start to do within your shape is find these diamonds that exist in every single formation and use those to teach the players how to move so here's how we do that now I'm going to try and explain this as best as I can. It's very difficult uh, when you can't really see it, but I'll do my best. Hopefully it works. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. I want you to imagine a tic-tac-toe board, okay? So within a tic-tac-toe board, there are nine squares, right? There's uh, It's a three by three, essentially. I want you to think about the corners of the tic-tac-toe board, right? And that's four squares and eliminate them. So essentially what you have is a middle square at the bottom, which we'll call the south side. Well, you'll have a center square. And then at the top, you'll have the top square at the north side. And then you'll have two squares, one on the east and one on the west. So in total, you have five squares. Hopefully that makes sense. That's how we're working on our tactical understanding. I have the south and the north squares as blues, and then I have the three squares in the middle as oranges. Let's talk about the blue squares first. At the bottom of the blue square is our goalkeeper. Then we have our two defenders, and then we either have at the top, we either have our center defensive mid or our third defender and it really just depends on the formation you're playing so i'll give you an example in 9v9 we play a 3-4-1 so it would be two defenders and our one center defender who's actually playing a center defensive mid and the instructions that i give them is when we have the ball i want you as a defensive mid playing in front of that defensive line as soon as we lose that ball you drop back into a center defender role. Now, 
from there, so that's the blue square. Let's talk about the east square now, okay? So on the east square, on the very end of that square is where the winger goes. Now, if you think about that box, that box has a bottom, right? Four, four sides. So on the left side is the winger. And then playing in that center square would be the midfielder, the center midfielder. If you're playing, for example, a 2-3-1, or if you're playing a 3-4-1, it would be uh, one of the center midfielders. If you're playing a 4-3-3, right, you could say that the uh, that would be a fullback. And then in there would be um, the attacking mids, right, the two attacking mids, and then fullback on the other side. There are so many different ways to do it. It just really depends on what age group, what formation you're working on, and so on. But let's talk about how we build out at the back, because I think that will give you a better idea of how we do it. So the goalkeeper has the ball. They move the ball to the defender, which is in that first blue square. That defender um, then passes the ball to the winger, right, or the wide midfielder. Now that wide midfielder has supported come down through the line. They receive that ball in the orange square. As soon as they receive it, that defender now pushes into the left square, and now they're the part of that bottom square. So that's that movement that we see from a defender usually, right? When to push up, when to come back. And if the def uh, the winger passes back to the defender, the defender to the goalkeeper, then the, de the defender would come back into that blue square and support again, right? So Ball comes back to the defender, defender to the wide, uh, to the winger. Winger receives it, defender pushes up. And then what we want is our center midfield to push over to the edge of the left side square, right? And we're working in a 2-3-1 at this point here, okay? And then what we can also have is we can have our forward who should be at the top square, right? The north square, they're usually pressing on defense. That's a square that we want them to press. They're going to move over into the top of the orange square, okay? The orange square, remember, are the middle squares. And then we can have give and goes, we can just move the ball within that. But that's the direction and that's how we're coaching the tactical IQ of the players, using a easy concept that we work on rondos and putting it into how we play in the match. And it makes the game so much easier because instead of having to worry about you know, seven sit different situations if you're playing 7v7 or nine different situations and in, in, in different positions and all that. Everything is the same because it's just a rondo in a different place of the field. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, that's only a little part of how we get our players to a high tactical level. There is a really, I think, um, what's what's the right word? <laughs> to try and and be kind about it um underutilized and not really talked about i think that's a good way of putting it part of the game that it's just it, it's just not taught and not emphasized enough and that's the idea of scanning you know if you think about walking through an intersection right and you're before you walk i mean we learn you know learn, look left look right look left look right and, and keep looking so you don't get hit by a car right you're gonna make walking town walking across the street look very easy but if someone told you to put a blindfold on or close your eyes and do it you're going to hesitate you're going to be scared uh, you're not going to be confident, right? And in fact, most of the time, you're not going to want to do it. And that makes sense, right? Now, it's the same thing in soccer. If you're not scanning and understanding what's going on around you, behind you, when you receive that ball, subconsciously, you're thinking about that player behind you coming and just, you know, taking the legs under you, pushing you. All these situations that decrease the player's confidence and awareness of what's going on so we have to add that as a core component of tactical understanding and increasing the iq level 
of soccer players. And the question is, well, how do we do that? How do we do that in a situation like this? How do we force players to scan, but not do it in what I call a drill type setting, right? So for me, drills have lines and they're not really game-like. I like to use small-sided games as a vehicle to teach every single concept. And I believe you can. You just have to find the right way to do it. So let's talk about the situation. And we'll go back to an episode that I did about how to create a specific session, right? The first thing that you do is you look for the situation in the field. And that situation is there's a player right behind me or very close to me. And I want to look and scan behind it to see what's going on, right? So that my first touch is away from the player. That's the situation that I want to create. So in the game, how do we do that? Especially in this type of situation. And I came up with a unique idea. Okay, hear me out. Here we go. As soon as your team loses the ball, every single player is assigned a player they're defending. And that's that, that's game realistic, right? If I'm a winger, I'm marking the winger, right? Every single player, if I midfielder, center midfielder, they're marking the other center midfielder, right? So in this situation, what I'm telling my players is as soon as we lose the ball, I want you to find your player and you must tag them on their back. Don't want you to tag them on their front, tag them on the back. The reason we tag them on their back is because we want to make sure that we're goal-sided, that we're blocking them, right? So that's the situation. Now we've created this situation, and that situation is being created over and over and over again without me having to coach it, right? Because I don't want to coach the defenders. I need to coach the offensive players. So I need to create that situation automatically, right? So like a game of tag, as soon as you lose the ball, you must tag your player. And I could even increase that difficulty and get and say, you have 10 seconds or five seconds to tag your player. And if you don't, they get an automatic goal or they get something, right? And that increases the urgency of the transition from offense to defense as well, right? So we can do that. Now, let's talk about scanning and how we coach scanning. First, we have to understand the two principles of scanning. There's two types of scanning, in my opinion. First one is called general scan. Okay, general scan is that you are scanning in general throughout the game. So generally you should be scanning and scanning means shoulder to shoulder. So you're looking from one shoulder to the other shoulder. And that's really important that you define what scanning is because if you don't, and you don't use the terminology shoulder to shoulder, then a quick glance behind one shoulder might be considered a scan for some players, but it's not because we want to look at both shoulders, right? So shoulder to shoulder. Okay, then there is a critical scan. A critical scan is a second before you receive that ball, you're just checking one more time. And it's the exact same thing we talked about through walking through an intersection, right? You go scan left, scan right, scan left, scan right. Then you walk. You don't stop scanning when you're crossing the street. You keep scanning side to side, side to side. That's the critical moment when you're about to be in it and when you're in it, right? That's when you're scanning. So for me, right before I get that ball, critical scan. So now we've defined it, right? We've created the situation. It's repeating itself, right? Repetition, check. We've defined what we're looking for from the player receiving the ball or attacker. And now we have to coach it, right? We have to coach how we're going to react in that situation. For me, because we have such a heavy focus on deceptive dribbling, and that is faking one way, going the other, that's exactly what we want to do before we receive that ball. So we do a, a general scan, right? Then we see that ball coming towards us. I do a critical scan, see where the opponent is, and then I fake one way, and as that ball comes to me, I should be able to take it. And hopefully the ideal position would be to beat them within that first touch. And that's what we're looking for. Can we fake one way? 
and then take that touch in the opposite direction that will hopefully take us forward. But at the least, it takes us into space. And that to me is a very high level of IQ for a youth player. If they can, within their first touch, every single time, either beat the player with their first touch, because that's, I think, what every coach would want, instead of having to dribble 1v1 or pass around an opponent, if they can just, within one touch, beat the player with a turn, right? I think that's the ideal situation, and that's what we want. So can they beat them with that turn, right? But in order to do that, they have to do that fake one way and go the other. But I think a scan, a critical scan, at the very least, is going to improve that player's first touch. Understanding that where that player is, and then we touch that ball into space, right? So I would say the very basic level would look like this, okay? Before I receive it, critical scan, receive the ball. That next level up would be critical scan, receive the ball, first touch into space. And then the last and the highest level would be critical scan, fake one way, receive the ball, touch that other way that beats the player with that first touch. And if you want an easy way to remember this or teach your players, we can go to uh, one of Tovo's core concepts. Uh, if you don't know what Tovo is, Google it, T-O-V-O. Um, incredible people. Uh, they use a concept called scan, choose, do. Okay, before you receive the ball, you scan shoulder to shoulder, then you make a decision. And when that ball comes, you do the decision, right? So for me, what I would add there is scan, choose, fake, and do, right? So I would just add the fake in there, right? Uh, that drop of the shoulder, right? So scan, I scan, uh, general scan, or you can talk about that critical scan as well. Uh, then I make that decision, right? So it would be, sorry, general scan first. Then I make the decision because I'm looking for the space, right? Once I look and see the space, then that ball should be coming to me. Then I do a critical scan. I fake one way. And then I uh, go the other way, which is where my decision was, right? So if I see space on my left, I'm going to fake right, receive it, and go left, right? With my first touch. Hopefully that was clear. Um, and hopefully that helps and, and, uh, you know, gives you a better understanding of, you know, the reason why scanning is so important, right? Cause if you don't know, you can't go forward. How do you, how can you go forward if you don't know what's behind you? Or if you're, if you're not facing, if you're facing your own goal, which for example, um, a, a nine would always, most of the game is facing their own goal, right? So if all they're doing is facing their own goal and they don't know what's going on behind them, how are they ever going to turn and, and do something effective, which is really what we want, especially with our number nines, with our number sevens, with our number 11s, right? Those players that are in the attacking formation, it started the attacking phase of play. They're the ones that are usually face to goal most of the time, right? So we want to change that and we want them to scan. That critical scan is so important. Now, there's obviously other ways to do this in a drill format. And just top of my head, uh, you know, one player at the top has the ball. And then you're playing 1v1 uh, with a goal, right? So that player with the ball makes the pass. And then that player has to make a decision, right? So they have to turn and score. Now, if I was working with three players, I would do that all day long, right? I think that's fantastic. But if I have more than three players... I don't know if I love that idea. It's just not, it's not the game, you know? It, it is repeating that part. It's repeating turning. I understand it, but I just can't get myself to do lines anymore. I just can't for the simple fact that it's not enjoyable, you know? Like the kids just aren't playing the game they're doing a drill. That's why it's called the drill and the game is called the game. And I can't put that ahead of the child, right? Fun comes first and you have to integrate learning into a fun environment. And for me, a drill environment is just not as fun. So I think there's always a way you just have to be creative 
to find a way to get a small sided game and just have the players continuously moving, right? I, I don't want one of my players for an, we have an hour and 20 minutes now. Practice. I don't want a single moment where that kid is standing there just passing the ball to someone. I just don't like it, right? The only other way this could work in my head is if that person who is making the pass is a coach. Other than that, I just don't see it as a viable option. I don't. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. Again, the goal of the practice for me is to have the kids play for all of it. In our 1v1 environment, yes, they sit, but it's a quick water break between rounds where the coach is making points, right? The kids are gassed. They shouldn't be able to talk. Like, it's just not that type of environment. And you know what? If the kids are talking, I'll make a point of going, okay, you're talking. That means you're not tired. That's my fault. Instead of three minutes, we're going five for that next round. Then they'll come off. They won't be able to say a word to each other. They'll be dead, right? So that's really what we're looking at. So for me, that's really important. And, and being creative, right? That tag in the back, that's creating that same situation. And then that critical scan. Right. You can have multiple balls going on. Right. So it's more engaging. But from a tactical point of view, I would say that a lot of the game is also not with the ball and understanding how to move when you don't have it. Right. So we usually have in these 7v7 or 9v9 games, we have three to four coaches working on that game. And every single coach has a different part. Right. So I'll take, for example, left side. Um, of the field i'll take half of it and then i'll have a coach on the right side on one side and then i'll have two coaches on the other side sometimes i'll even have coaches uh behind the goalkeepers talking to the goalkeepers helping them because the goalkeeper for us is such an important part of the game and i want them to talk the whole time the whole time and give specific instructions this weekend in that girls tournament there was uh, a young goalkeeper and she was great you know always talking, always this, always that, loved it. But she was using general terms. When the ball went out, she would say, you know, mark up, mark up, love the communication. But mark up doesn't mean anything, right? If I'm a forward and I hear my goalkeeper saying mark up, I don't know they're talking to me. I'll probably say, okay, I'm a forward. I, I don't need to do that, okay? And then if I'm a defender, I'll say, well, oh, you know, the guys are behind me. Yeah, I'm marked. I'm marking them, right? That's not good enough for our goalkeepers. Our goalkeepers, we always talk about making sure that they give specific instructions to specific players. I don't want anything general. Johnny, pick up number eight. Eric, pick up number seven, right? That's what we're looking at. When the ball's in the wing, right? That's when the goalkeeper should be scanning, talking, specific instructions, right? This all has to do with IQ level and just the tactical understanding of what's going on. And for me, that is the component that we're working on in those 7v7, 9v9 drills. Now, sorry, games. Now, I want to be clear. It's not a full session of that. There's still 1v1s, there's still rondos, and then we do those things as well. So um, it's not like we're done <laughs> with the 1v1s, 2v2s, but we are spending a lot more time in those environments because we haven't had that when we were indoors. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of Coaching Soccer Weekly. I'm really excited to announce that we have about 420 people uh, in, the, well, coaches <laughs> in the Facebook group. So if that's something that you're interested in, simply look up Coaching Soccer Weekly on Facebook and you can join that. Uh, super free, uh, which is the best kind of stuff uh, and the best way to get your information is to get it for free, right? <laughs> Although I think uh, there's some quality information uh, that you can also pay for. And if that's something you're looking for, I would recommend uh, Audible. You know, I'm not a sponsor of Audible or anything, but I do their monthly plans. And every month I somehow stumble upon a new book that has changed or had a huge impact on either my business career, soccer career, uh, the way that I'm teaching, just, uh, it, it's a really great investment. And I think it's only like $14.99 a month for a free audiobook every month. So 
that's how I consume information along with podcasts as you do as well. So uh, sounds like we're both uh, getting something out of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for listening this week. Uh, this weekend, I have three games that I'll be attending. I'll be attending the 2013, 2012, and then our 2014 in that order. So I'm excited to see how things go. Uh, this will be the first game that we've ever played in a tier one. And we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm nervous. I'm excited. But most importantly, I just kind of want to see the competition and the difference between tier one and two. Because that's not really something that I've seen before. And I'll share that with you next week. So until then, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the moment. But most importantly, enjoy the game. Hey, thanks for watching all the way to the end. And you can check out more of our videos right here. And if you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you'd hit the like button and the subscribe button.